Okay, so we, today we, we will talk about two topics. And the first one is software design patterns uh, and anti-patterns. So there is a book which was quite instrumental uh, in my uh, learning about programming. Uh, so let's go here. Oh, come on. Let me let me just redo this. Share screen. Okay. That's better. So gang of four. That's a book. Um which was written by uh, four software engineers. Um, and it became kind of a de facto um, place for um, checking all the object-oriented design patterns. So Eric Gamma, Richard Helm, Ralph Johnson, and John Lissides, those four guys wrote this book. Uh, and this book became kind of a de facto go for book for C++ and Java and for other object-oriented uh, languages as uh, that kind of a definite C um, set of design patterns for object-oriented programming. Uh, and those, uh, those design patterns ended up in a lot of APIs. So a lot of those design patterns are actually part of the API for um, C++ collections or for Java. So for example, there is a um, observer pattern and the observer pattern is actually an observable interface in Java and you can use that pattern from, from the API already, right? Um, so there is a lot, of, um, a lot of patterns. There is one called interpreter, which might be useful for the second assignment if you were doing it in an object-oriented uh, language, <laughs> but we were not. So neither Rust or uh, Haskell Kind of follow into those uh, those categories, and the reason is because those patterns are exclusively for object-oriented languages. So, what is the like, what is the big big difference between uh, object-oriented and um, functional, or like Haskell and Rust and Java or C plus plus? So, if, if we have kind of Rust let's slash Haskell, and then we have uh, Java slash C plus plus, what is the biggest Biggest difference, like how would you summarize though? I would say that in Rust and Haskell, we don't really use for loops. Yeah, so uh, leg of loops or for, for loops. Kind of more relies on math and filters. Yeah, so um, more collection iterators based on maps, faults, and so on. Yeah, that's true. Here we have uh, more dependency on loops, but it's the same. Like this, this that that's true for Golang as well, right? So th this is true for Golang here. So Golang would belong to this category, right? Yeah. Yep. Better? Or oh, still too small? Yeah, we can still make it. Okay. All right. So that's this is true for Golang too, but there is like a more fundamental difference. So a more like really fundamental difference between those two approaches is that here we program we program with functions manipulating data. Okay? Here we program with data with attached functions, right? So when we think about the problem with, um, so let's move this. So th th those are those are good. Those are uh, those additional uh, differences. But the fundamental one is it's like um, OO paradigm is data centric, right? So data becomes kind of a central point and then functions are attached to it. They are kind of encapsulated together with data. So when we say person, we mean 
a data structure for name, age, blah, 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 with some operations attached to it here, right? So here it's that data centric. So we have um, data first, behavior second, and functions attached to objects. Here we say functions first, data second, right? So where the data comes from or how we put data into functions is secondary. What we think is how the, how the logic flows, how the transformations of data flow. So because of that, a lot of patterns which are very useful and very uh, natural for object-oriented paradigm, they kind of don't make sense in, in this paradigm because we have functions. We can do everything very easily with functions. So um, let's start with uh, a simple uh, exercise. So imagine, which we already did actually, if you recall uh, very early days of this course, we've done this exercise. Imagine that you have an API and the API has a function um, which registers a handler for your HTTP requests, right? So let's, let's, uh, let's call this function uh, register. Register, and this function takes, I'm, I'm writing pseudocode now, right? It doesn't matter what language we're gonna use. And this function takes a handler and the handler has a signature which takes a request and the response objects, right? So we have to register a handler which take request and response, right? That's what we have to do. You have to do it for cloud a lot, like for the uh, some of the um, handlers for H HTTP. So now we have our handler and our handler will take request and response, of, of course, but we have to handle we have to, to handle the request and to send the response, we have to look up into a database, right? So we have to have access to a database, right? So now we have to pass a database to this API. So we have an API which tells us, okay, uh, we have to write code which um, expects a function callback called handler, which takes request and response. And this handler doesn't take anything else, right? So then how can we write our own handler such that it fits into that API, that it is only request response, but we inject database to it? How can we do that? So how, how we write this? How, how would you write this? How did you write it in cloud in Golang? I, I don't, like you don't have to write any, um, concrete uh, um, syntax, like we can use Golang or we can use Rust or we can use whatever. Uh, we just need to have the pattern, right? So the idea about patterns is that those patterns are kind of independent of the programming language. They are just certain structures that we use in our software development such that they are kind of repeatable and recognizable, right? So this is one of those patterns. Um, which you probably have used for Go uh, for a cloud course. So how how do we do that? So online people, you can write um, in a chat like a pseudocode. Um, all right, let's see. Right, so um, Oyston is suggesting, can you read this or it's too small? It's too small probably. Okay, I can make it bigger. I'm not sure if online people see it, but I'm, I'm reading uh, Oyston comment. Uh, so for Go, you can create a method on the object which returns a function with parameter request and response. Exactly. So you don't even need to have a method, right? You can have a function which does that, okay? So if you if you na naively say, like I will use kind of a Golang sy syntax. So if you say I have a func, which is my handler, and I take request response, and then I, I want to write a body, and I need 
needs DB access here, uh, the most naive implementation is, okay, let's use a global variable, right? <laughs> and then from global variable, I can say DB and do something with DB, right? It's like, that. that's wrong. That's a code, code smell right here, right? So we don't want to have a global variable, okay? So global variable is out. So how can we have a variable here, which is injected, but it's not in the parameter list? Well, the thing is you can, um, you can convert what um, what you really need by having kind of a outer function which generates the function that you need. Okay, so my handler, so my my business logic is here. So business logic is here, and I have to use DB. I have to um, have to use DB, right? I have to use the DB do something with the DB. All right, so that, that has to stay. It has to stay like this, and it has to be request response because I will be using a DB, I will be using a request, and I will be generating some response, okay? So this code stays as it is. Uh, I have to have request response returned, but uh, I don't need this name. And what I will do is I will use this pattern. So I will say, okay, I have my handler generator, which takes a DB of type DB, and then it returns punk like this, right? So, Suddenly, I have a function which only takes two parameters, but it also has access to DB, which I pass to this outer thing, right? So now, if I need to register my, my handler, I can register it like register, and then my handler generator, and I pass the DB to, to it, right? I pass the reference to the DB to my generator, and the generator will generate me a function with the signature request response and pass it to the register function, right? So I have used a higher order function because uh, this function is high order because why my handler generator is a, is a higher order function? What is the definition of higher order functions? Come on, people. So, higher order functions. How can we recognize that something is higher order? Okay, so what is a function? Hmm? So we have some vocabulary questions here. We have method, we have procedure, and then we have function. And then we have pure function, and then we have higher order function. So procedure first. Procedure is what sequence of steps typically does not return anything okay method okay function first function steps that return something yeah sequence of steps typically takes parameters, typically returns results, right? So if you have a function which doesn't take anything, that's a bit weird function, right? If you have function which takes parameters but doesn't return anything, 
it kind of feels more like a procedure. All those terms are a little bit fuzzy. There is an overlap, right? And then different programming languages use different terms for different things. Like for example, in uh, Pascal, they called procedures for everything. Like they didn't use the term function, they use the term procedure, right? And it was for both. Um, okay, but typically procedure doesn't, doesn't take anything and doesn't return anything. It's just a sequence of steps. It can take some parameters, and re but then usually it doesn't return anything. Function takes something and returns something. Okay, uh, pure function. It is a function. must return something, right? If, if, if it doesn't return anything, then it cannot be a pure function. And the, the most important condition, the result only depends on the input variables. It cannot, okay, result, The result cannot depend on the state of the world outside of the function, right? So a pure function uh, takes some parameters and produces a result. And it's pure because the result is always the same. For the same input, it will always produce the same result. There is no state which is involved. Okay, so then we have one more. We have method. What's a method? It's a function or procedure attached to a data object or struct, right? So if we have a function which operates on that, on that data struct or data object, then it's a method. Okay, um, and the method by definition takes the object data struct as a parameter, right? Otherwise it, otherwise it would be function, normal function, if it doesn't take that object. So different languages, again, do it differently. In, uh, in Golang, you, your syntax kind of is a little bit more uh, implicit because the, the actual, um, so in Golang, if you have, Punk and you have uh, my type. If you say m my type, then um, method name this m is accessible in the body, right? In in Rust you have self, right? We have this kind of a variable called self. In Java, you have this, and in some other programming languages. Okay, so then higher order functions. It is a function. It must take a function or return a function as a result. S parameter. So if we have a function which takes another function as a parameter or returns a function, then it's a higher order function, right? So in our case, my handler generator is higher order function because it returns a function. Good. That will be in the exam. And you will have to remember that. Uh, all right. So we can use higher order functions to solve a lot of problems in programming. Um, are higher order functions available in, um, in C++ and in Java? Can you return a function in C++? Yeah. Can you take a function as a parameter? Yeah, you can. Is it easy? It's it is possible, but it's not 
typically idiomatic way of programming with those languages. The idiomatic way for programming in Java and C++ is to use classes and objects. Uh, you can use uh, higher order functions in Java and C++, but it's a little bit painful and people tend not to do that, right? So if you have problem like this, um, they usually will not do this. They will usually handle it differently, right? Um, they will use the patterns from the book uh, to say how how it is how it is done. Um, so what I do recommend you is I I you don't need to know all the patterns, right? Um, it, it it is a little bit uh, too much. But some of the patterns, like a visitor pattern, uh, visitor pattern is very useful for writing parsers or for processing kind of um, uh, type data structures. Again, assignment two, kind of here, uh, because what will happen is you have a, a linear structure or a tree with typed nodes. So you have a plus operation or div division operation or integer and so on, right? For assignment two. And then you need to do something for each of those. So then visitor pattern is perfect for that because it separates an algorithm on the data structure per type, right? So a visitor pattern uh, changes like in if you were not to use it, if, if you were to do a visitor pattern in C, what you will end up is, is a, a big switch statement. And in the switch statement, you would say, uh, for case this, do this, for case this, do this, right? So for each type, you will be doing some behavior, right? But the visitor pattern changes the switch statement or kind of a chain number of if statements into a very nice, a very, um, um, Let's see if they have um, if they have a diagram. Not really. So they're using kind of um text. Yeah, but anyway, so what will happen is you have you can define what to do per uh um per particular um item on on the instead of having like a four case statements we will have um four elements that kind of do something and then your behavior will be matching what you need to do so you will be kind of doing like a object oriented pattern matching on the type that you need to do something with and the method will kind of pick appropriate behavior based on the type. Uh, so, and the, uh, the easy way for extending it is adding kind of additional, um, additional methods for, uh, for different, um, so is you usually what you have is you have kind of a single method uh, called in this case they call it visit um, and then based on the type you will do a, a slightly different behavior right so it's kind of like a single single method but it has multiple implementations per type of what you need to do and then you will use that to say okay process this node and if it is an addition, the, the addition behavior will kick in. If it's an integer, the in integer behavior will, will kick in. So you don't actually have if statement anywhere. The matching will be done by the method signature, right? So it's kind of a much nicer to deal with the more complex uh, problems. Is the visitor pattern kind of reusable in, um, in um, functional programming? Of course it is. You can have uh, the same method and or function, which takes different type of arguments. And then you just implement it multiple times, right? So if I have, let's say I have a two, two things to do. I have, um, I have to do something for integers and then I have to do something for floats, right? So I will have process and then I will take an int and I have a process and I will take a float, right? 
And this is my body, like a uh, body for dealing with the integers. And here I will have body for dealing with floats. And then if I have a collection and I'm iterating over a collection and I say process and I pass the item, then I don't care. Like uh, if it's an int, the process int will kick in. If it's a float, process float will kick in, right? So we're using that. We're using visitor pattern in uh, Haskell or in Rust for assignment two as well. We just make it like, it, it's so much easier to do it this way. Like you can you can look it up, like how kind of uh, a lot of boilerplate code you have to do for Java to kind of achieve the same thing. You have to have an interface, you have to kind of uh, type your things properly and so on. But it's as simple as this, right? It's as trivial as this. And then if you need a third one suddenly to do, what do what you need to do here? Well, you just need to add an extra process new type, right? Uh, and then it will work. I don't need to change anything here. Whereas in Java, I will have to add this line in the interface. I will have to add additional machinery, additional boilerplate plate code. Um, okay, so we, um, we kind of did this via the higher order function uh, and we squeezed in um, this additional parameter into our body. So the body is kind of the same as it would be if we didn't need DB, but we have this DB here. So this, this function has a special name. What's the name of this function? So this function has a special name because it takes this parameter into the, the body. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> no? What other names for functions do you know? Lambdas. Lambdas, yeah. So lamb it is a lambda, yeah. Lambda. What is the synonym for lambda? What what we call lambdas? Some languages call them lambdas, some languages call them, and Oyston got it right. Here is the answer. Anonymous functions, perfect. So lambda is an anonymous function. Cool, so is this an anonymous function? Is it a lambda, this, this func? Yeah, it is, good. What else, what else it is? What, what other name do you know for functions? Inline function. Inline function, yeah. Function yes, it is. What else? Come on, you know it. You know it from Rust. Static. Huh? Static. static functions, yes, is it? No, this one is not a static function. Closure. Yes, perfect. So what is a closure? Exactly. Closure is a function which takes into it its scope something from the environment, right? Um, so another pattern, another very uh, interesting pattern is, let's say you need to have a counter. Let's say you need to um, count how many times a function is called, okay? So um, if I have, uh, let's say I have my func, so my func is doing something and I have some business logic here, so business logic, and here I would like to say count, and I want to count uh, how many times it was called. And count returns, uh, so let's let's make count to return the current count, okay? And it will increment the counter, right? So um, how can I generate a count function such that it will keep track of how many times I called my func? Um, so let's say I have, Let's say I pass uh, 
All right, so we have to pass that function to, to our count, right? So we need to do a little bit of a trick. So let's say I have my main and in my main, I'm calling uh, my func. So I'm calling my func and then I want to say count to get, so I have some sort of a while loop or something. Yeah, so while I will say it's a pseudocode. So I'm doing some while, I'm calling my func multiple times and eventually I'm saying how many times here and then I'm printing it. But I will need to have this um, count. So count equals something. And then I have to say, um, I have to pass my, I have to pass count to my, my um, func. So I will say count is a func which doesn't take any arguments and doesn't return anything, right? So how can we do this? Like, what would that be? So you can say, okay, let it's easy. We will say uh, we have um, we have a counter. Counter is zero, and then we have a func, which doesn't take any arguments. Oops, and it basically says counter plus plus, right? Would that work? No. Why not? Because uh, counter is not a stop uh, for the plus plus. No, it's not. It's uh, you know, this this func is defined in the scope of these close brackets, and the counter is visible, so it is a closure. Here it is a closure, which uses this as a kind of a um, global variable, right? I could even move it. I could move counter a to be a, a true global variable. That would suck even more, right? So that sucks. We have a global variable. Um, that sucks also. If I if I do this, that sucks as well. That smells because it's a global variable. Like what if somebody here, like uh, in the while loop says counter equals zero, right? The whole thing is like broken now, right? It's like bad, bad scoping, right? We don't want the global variables hanging around if people should not be using them, right? So we need a better solution here, right? So what is a better solution? I'm thinking maybe um, it could take itself as a counter. I'm not so sure if that's even possible, but yeah. Yeah, you probably are on a kind of a good track. So what we want is we want to hide a counter such that nobody can see it, but count can see it, right? So count function is a function which has a parameter which nobody else sees. In object-oriented programming, how would you do that? Like you would probably do it by saying, okay, I have a class. I have a class counter, which has, which has some sort of a field like int counter, which is private, right? And then I have a count function which does the increments for the counter and returns the current counter, right? Something like this. But th this is a class and we are trying to solve it using a kind of a functional programming where we don't have a concept of a class, but we have a an ability to hide privately this counter inside the functions as well. Again, we will use closure for that. So what we will do is we will have a function. So let's call it func counter generator, which doesn't take any parameters and it returns a function which takes no parameters and returns an int. 
and our function generator will return a func, which doesn't take any parameters and returns an int and it will do counter plus plus. So let's see. Old value equals counter, counter plus plus, and then return old value, right? We could return counter minus one also. Uh, and then we don't have counter, but we can squeeze in counter here. So we can say counter equals zero. And here we will say, count equals counter generator. Right, so that's our implementation. So counter generator is a higher order function because it returns as a function. This function has a hidden internal variable which nobody has access to apart from this function which it returns, right? Nobody can manipulate this counter. Only this function can manipulate this counter. And then this count can be called. Uh, so we, we can call it. And it returns the previous value. So if we if my count was kind of, uh, my func was uh, incrementing this, then we can see how many, how many times it was called by, by doing that. The whole point here is this, kind of a hidden variable. And it's only one here, but it can be multiple, right? Uh, also, you can pass additional state. You can pass uh, parameters, params here, which will be visible to this kind of function too, right? But this one is a private. This one is a private field. It's a private value that nobody has ever access to. You kind of encapsulated the state inside the higher order function, uh, and you have this kind of a worker function inside, right? All right, and is this a closure? Is this func a closure? Yeah. Yes, it is, because it uses counter from outside of its scope, right? Is this function a closure? No. Is this function an anonymous function? No. Is, is it a pure function? Yes. yes. Is it a method? No. Is it a higher order function? Yes. Perfect. All right. So we're on the same page. Great. So um, more patterns. Uh, let's let's do. Um, Let's do something else. So let's do one more, um, one more pattern. So let's say, let's say we have this behavior. Okay, so we have, we have a function which is called process. And this function takes, um, so we have a func, func process, and this function takes another function, which is an item. And, okay, so this function doesn't return anything, and this one, uh, let's say this one doesn't return anything neither. And here is the business logic, right? The business logic for this. And then, um, let, yeah, let's make it even simpler. So let's say this function takes an item of type item. It's a pseudo Golang syntax. So uh, we have a process function which takes an item and then does the business logic for it, right? And then we have a loop. So here I will have some pseudo code. So let's say in my main, um, I have some loop and in the loop, I'm calling a process um, with 
like okay so let's say for i um range my items then i'm doing process process i okay it works It works fine, right? So now let's say I want to add. So what I would like to do is I would like to inject um, So there was a question uh, from Oyston. Will the counter value persist every time the function is called uh, as if it, as if it is static? So the, the question is here. And the answer is yes. So the in the previous in the previous example, when we had we had this uh, outer outer func, and then we had counter, and then we had the inner uh, closure uh, inner func, then um, this counter will exist forever until this inner func is out of scope and not used anywhere anymore, right? So if the uh, compiled language or uh, garbage collected language will know that inner func is never called up again or ever used again, then it will be garbage collected, then it will be uh, disposed. But other than that, this is like a, as if it is static uh, field in a class and it is, it, it's persistent per this, um, generator but if i have so if i say counter one equals uh, my counter generator and i generated the counter one and counter two equals my counter generator two right so i have two generators then i have two counters and they are independent of each other. They are two fields and they are both static and they will be kind of independent, right? So calling uh, calling uh, counter one will increment the, the first one and calling counter two will in increment the second one, right? So they are independent, but both will persist. All right, so that's the previous one. Okay, so here we have uh, this. What we want is we want to inject uh, a certain behavior. It, it's, uh, by the way, it's called a de decorator pattern. So if we go back. So a decorator is you want to uh, modify the behavior in such a way that it's um, updated dynamically uh, during runtime, right? So if you want to do this, if you want to change the behavior to, to inject something uh, inside your methods, usually what we want is for debugging purposes, we may want to inject uh, something at the beginning and something at the end of, of the function. So we want to say, uh, I'm calling process and then I'm, I finish processing, right? Maybe you want to time how long the processing took. So then what we would like to do is you would like to inject. So, so currently like, the, the logic of what, what is happening here is like this. We have a loop um, and in the loop, we call process and then we process the, the things, right? So what we want to do is we want to change it to have a loop and then we want to call print um, starting processing. You then you want to do process and then call process and then you want to call print um done processing right you want to be able to do this and you want to be able to do this behavior this decorations at runtime like depending what you want right you can ask user okay user what do you want and the user will say i want this then you want to do this right so how we you can, in object-oriented way, you would do it via the decorator pattern, right? In functional programming, how would you do that? Well, it's actually quite straightforward because uh, what, what, like here you have everything baked in, right? 
the behavior is baked in into this loop, right? Um, so let's let's not call it main. Let's call it uh, processing loop, right? So our processing loop kind of has the behavior already baked in, right? Um, so this is what will happen. Uh, what we want is we want this flexibility of a, and ability to add these extra things, right? So in that case, uh, all we want is we want the processing loop to have um, a parameter, which is process. And the process is a function which takes an item as a parameter, right? So process is a function which takes an item as a parameter, and then the loop calls process and does that, right? So in our main, so if we have main, originally we had processing loop, and we had the default behavior, OK? So we had it like this. And that was the default behavior, like a call process. And the process is like process. We don't want to touch process. That's our business logic, right? Well, we only want to decorate it. We want to add something outside of the process, right? Um, so that was the original one. And now with the change of the signature, we have it like this. We say processing loop, and we pass process. We pass this function to our processing loop. So behavior didn't change. We refactor our code and the behavior didn't change, right? But what changed is now we have a flexibility of being able to decorate our behavior, right? Why and how? Well, um, so observe. We have, I will make it a little bit more compact. So we have our main which is calling the processing loop. The processing loop takes this process function and does the business logic. So it's exactly as it was. So we can undo that. And it's doing and it's doing this loop. So now if we were to change it to this loop, how how we would do that? Now we want to do achieve this. Well, it's it's kind of so so let's say we have um here we ask the user. Ask the user, do you want debug or not? Okay, if not, we do this. Okay. If yes, we do, do we do what? We do processing loop. And now we don't call the original process, but we pass a function which takes an item i as a parameter and print here process i and print, right? So we decorated this process with additional behavior at the beginning and at the end. Uh, we pass it to our processing loop as a function, same as we did here with the unmodified version, right? All you need to do is you need to have a function which takes item as a parameter, and then it will just work. So I'm I'm kind of doing pseudo code like Go Golangish, uh, but it will work in any language. Like it will work in Haskell, it will work in Rust, it will work in any language which takes functions as parameters, right? So you can use the same pattern in, in Rust. Um, so this is like how would you do the decorations? You will basically use um, instead of hard wiring the call to process um, inside the um, the processing loop, you will make it kind of a parameterized by the function which you're actually calling in your loop. And then you can call the same function like uh, if you don't want any decorations. And if you need decorations, you just squeeze in something else. 
and then it, the the uh, processing loop doesn't care. The processing loop doesn't care what you what you pass to it. It will always call it inside the loop, right? And then you can do the decorations like the way you want. So you can do some measurements, you can do some printouts, you can do whatever you need. You cannot do printouts in Haskell, but uh, in Rust you can, right? <laughs> But in um, in Haskell, you can do some debugging, like uh, you can kind of uh, do some debugging input uh, outputs, or you can do some uh, time measurements. Okay, so I kind of did it like very hand wavy and a little bit fast, but we basically said uh, we basically covered the decorator pattern, um, and we covered um, the uh, visitor a little bit. And we covered this um, injection, uh, which is probably, um, yeah, which is probably kind of an, an adapter. It's a little bit difficult to map it exactly because most of those patterns, they don't kind of make sense in functional language because you can always use higher order function to achieve it. Um, but they do make sense in object-oriented programming. So if you're programming in Java or in C++, then you have to be familiar with those uh, with those patterns. And if you do need decorations, you will probably follow the decorator pattern. Um, you can achieve the same behavior like with this um, um, higher order function. But as I said, in most um, C++ or Java, programming environments, that solution would be non-idiomatic. People would say, yeah, it works, but it kind of feels weird because it, it, you know, you're supposed to use a decorator pattern instead, which by the way, is a bit more painful and more boilerplate, uh, boilerplate code. Okay, so one, uh, so advice to you is to check those um, gang of four design patterns. Uh, you can check the book. If you're really programming in Java, C Sharp, or C++, you kind of need to read the book. Uh, if you don't, then you don't need to read the book. You can use the functional uh, solutions to that. Um, there is another, uh, another side to this story. It's called anti-patterns. What are anti-patterns? Anti-patterns are software engineering patterns which you should avoid. You should not use them. You will recognize them as a pattern and say, shit, we should not use that. So there is another book, which is called Anti-Patterns. And this book is about all the patterns which are not supposed to be used. They are harmful. They are making the code harder to maintain. They uh, make more code, more boilerplate, and so on and so forth. So if you read, uh, if you read the Gang of Four book, you definitely need to read this book because this book criticizes some of the other patterns as anti-patterns. They are not supposed to be used. And one of the famous ones, which is a topic of a lot of discussions is called singleton. So singleton is a pattern in the original book. And it's one of the major anti-patterns in the anti-pattern book saying, yeah, you should never use singleton pattern because it is like global state, it's like a global kind of variable and it's more harm than help, right? So it's kind of interesting how the space has been evolving because we have been teaching singleton when I came here eight years ago as a pattern. And then about five years ago, we started teaching it as an anti-pattern. <laughs> so students who graduated six years ago think it's a good thing, whereas students who graduated you know, uh, four years ago, they know it's a bad thing, right? Um, Things change. We learn more about, um, yeah, so Oyston is saying uh, we were taught to use singleton in graphics programming as a pattern, as a solution, right? Um, yeah, so always take it with a grain of salt. Uh, it is kind of like using global state, right? So should you use global state? No, you generally should not use global state. But if not using global state makes the solution even harder, then you should take the lesser evil, right? If the solution is even worse without using a global state, then okay, let's go with the less smelly code. Um, so it depends, but 
generally singleton is an anti-pattern. It's not a pattern that you're supposed to use. Uh, you're not supposed to use it. If you're using singleton, so one argument for graphics programming is that, well, you know, you have a single keyboard, you have a single rendering screen. Why bother with all this fancy object-oriented metaphors and blah, 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 if they are really single things, right? Yeah, that is kind of a valid argument. The problem is the moment you want to mock it, the moment you want to mock some of the things that are related to keyboard and you're relying on the singleton, which attaches you to the real keyboard, you cannot substitute it. You cannot use unit tests for like uh, mocking a keyboard and pretending that the user typed something on the keyboard, right, for your tests. Then you're kind of doomed because you baked your code onto the singleton pattern and the real keyboard, right? Yeah, so uh, I think even in graphics, you probably should not use singleton. Uh, you probably should be flexible. You should bind it to a real keyboard for most of the time. But if you really want to unit test something and you want to pretend that user is typing something on the keyboard, then you can uh, submit the mock instead of the real keyboard, right? All right, so uh, patterns and anti-patterns. Uh, Check it out, uh, read both books if you are into object-oriented programming. If you're not really into object-oriented programming, then I would not bother because um, as I said, and as I showed you, most of the things which we do in functional programming are kind of using functions uh, or methods and you're kind of using higher order functions a lot. Uh, and once you get used to these ideas of using higher order functions, suddenly life is much easier. There is a lot of boilerplate with those object-oriented patterns because they are um, because they're they are um, um, data first, not behavior first, right? Here we are behavior first. Here we are data first, and because of that, a lot of things become kind of ugly because the patterns are about behavior. All the patterns, all the design patterns are about behavior. Right, and in the in the programming language where data comes first, the behavior is always a little bit kind of um, clumsy. Okay, so any questions about this? It's a little bit complicated because it's, it may feel a little bit abstract to you, but I'm sure you were exposed to some patterns already, and I'm sure you've been using some of them, um, like builder, factory, uh, prototype and the infamous singleton, they are kind of very useful and we often use them. Um, and we use some of them in uh, functional programming as well. All right, so that was the first, uh, first topic of our today's discussion. The second one is a little bit more um, complicated and, and it's especially complicated in, uh, in Rust. So we will like, well, is my, all right, where is my screen? I lost a window. Oh, come on. That's the one here. That's not the one I want. Okay, never mind. I cannot find a window. So I need to make a new one. All right, let's do a new one. Okay, so uh, the second topic is uh, I will also use pseudocode because different initially, because different programming languages have uh, different syntax for this. Uh, but let's go and talk about asynchronous programming. So Again, we need some um, we need some terms. So the first first we need to clarify what is 
uh, parallel, parallel and concurrent. What's the difference? Concurrent. So which one means together at the same time? And I would say concurrent. It kind of it's one after the other, but uh, in short sequences and parallel is literally both together at the same time. Perfect. So that is together at the same time. Um, truly together. And this one is together, but one at a time. Um, involves context switching. Uh, can be simulated on a single processor. Uh, requires truly parallel hardware, multiple processing units. Okay. So if I have an exam question and I tell you, you have a laptop, laptop with eight cores and there are 16 um, processes running. Are the processes parallel or concurrent? Good. <laughs> Yes. So, question answer. Perfect. All right. So, um, when we program, when we program with Golang or when we program with Rust, and we use things like, um, channels or uh, go routines or uh, async await with Rust. Are we doing power programming or are we doing concurrent programming? Concurrent. So we typically talk about concurrency, concurrency, and concurrent programming. Because we sort of don't care how we, we on the level of abstraction, where we say we have two jobs or two things to do to, to be done together, but we kind of don't care if they are really done together or if they are done concurrently, right? So if, even if we have a single threaded architecture, but a single uh, CPU architecture, and we say we need to do graphics rendering and physics calculations and user input, we need three threads. We sort of don't really mean to do it at the same time. We sort of say, yeah, they have to be done at the same time, but if the CPU, single CPU kind of multi uh, context switches between those three things, as long as it's quick and as long as those three things happen sort of uh, seamlessly, then we don't care, right? So that's why we talk about concurrency. However, if you have some kind of a mathematical problem or you're doing physics simulations and you want to use 256 cores on your architecture and you say, I really want those multiplications to be done in parallel, we use different constructs, right? So for parallel programming, we use slightly different uh, metaphors and slightly different things. And for concurrency and concurrent programming, we use slightly different ones, right? Uh, the biggest difference is that for, um, for real parallel uh, programming, we often use um, a metaphor, which is, um, uh, single instruction, multiple data. 
So there are certain CPU instructions which some programming languages have. So it's a single instruction, multiple data. And that's what you had in graphics, like on the GPU, you're saying, I want this calculation to happen for all the pixels, right? So you're defining a, a shader which says, I want you know this calculation to happen on all the pixels in the image. And then you have a result and it, it is actually a single instruction. All the calculations will happen at the same time uh, at once on the uh, GPU to do this calculation, right? So we often use this uh, single instruction, multiple data paradigm, whereas for concurrency, for concurrency, what what do we do? We say multiple instructions, multiple data, right? Um, instructions, multiple data, right? Um, so then there are different metaphors here as well. Um, so here. It's mostly um, kind of a GPU. Uh, here we have um, concept of threads uh, or processes, right? Um, and that means we actually, the, um, the underlying operating system simulates multiple processes for us and context switches between them, if you, even if you have a single CPU or schedules them on multiple uh, hardware threads as, as in this uh, question, which we had, um, I deleted the question, yeah. So if you have eight hardware cores, you cannot run more than eight parallel threads, but you can run more, right? And in the operating systems, we usually do, do many more, right? So if you go and say PS, all processes I have, um, I have quite, like, you know, the, the last process has a number 88,000, right? So uh, of course, not all of them are still alive, but it's usually quite a long list of processes which are currently like running on my laptop, which has limited uh, hardware um, uh, parallel cap capabilities. All right, so um, how are we doing with time? We're not doing too well. Uh, we have some additional concepts. So we have threads and processes. How do you threads and processes in Golang or in Rust? So in Go, if I want to start uh, two things concurrently, what do I do? I have a func A and I have func B. And then in my main, I want to say, okay, run, you know, uh, run A and B concurrently, how do I do it? Oh, come on. You've been programming Golang for the whole semester in cloud, right? You didn't. You did? Yeah. Well, you just say go. Go A, go B, okay? Now A and B run concurrently, right? Um, in Rust, how you do that? Okay, so Rust is more complicated. Uh, Rust is more complicated because it doesn't have a runtime system and it doesn't have a garbage collector. So things have to be a little bit more verbose. But uh, there are generally two mechanisms. One mechanism is based on processes, which is based on threads. And then what you do is you say uh, thread spawn and it takes a closure. So uh, thread spawn takes a closure and runs the closure in a separate process, right? So it will kind of execute it uh, thread. It will execute it in a, as a separate process concurrently with something else, right? Uh, so if I have a main and my main function, uh, if, if my main calls this, then how many threads will I have? So imagine that I am doing this, um, then how many threads, how many processes will I be running if I call this? 
if I call it once? Which one? This one, the closure will run in that process. How about the main? Exactly. So the rest of the main is here. <laughs> so you will have two, right? Um, when you start a new thread, you're adding one extra thread to the one which you already have. The main thread is always a process. It's always a, a thread. And it's always called main thread. In all programming languages, the main thread, which is the one which the main has, is the main thread, right? And then you can start extra threads. So the main thread comes here, and then what happens? Exactly. So what happens when the main thread finishes before the child threads are running? It kind of depends. It depends a little bit on the programming language, right? Um, in Golang, uh, all the other children are killed and the main thread is finished. Uh, in, in Rust, is the same. So if you started a thread which hasn't started yet and then you ended up here, then everything kind of goes down and every, everybody is killed. Like <laughs> all the children's threads are killed and then the main thread finishes, right? So usually when the main thread finishes, the system says, okay, I mean, we are done, right? Therefore, I'm going to kill all the children. If the runtime system or, or the language doesn't do that, the operating system will do that because the operating system has a hierarchy. It, it says, okay, I was running the main thread and the main thread started all those children, which are now orphaned because I am killing the main thread. So that means all those orphans, well, I need to kill them as well, right? It's a very politically incorrect language. <laughs> I just realized that. So all the orphans are gonna get killed. Um, all right, so that's how it works most of the time. Um, and that's how it works in Golang, like with this and with this. So then if you don't want, if you don't want um, the children to be killed, uh, you need to maintain the main thread until the children are done. And then when the children are done, then you can kind of uh, finish, right? So how, how do you do that? We have a concept of a join. Right, so there is a term called join, and uh, in many programming languages or libraries, you have this concept of join, um, where you sort of uh, the main thread waits for the uh, children threads to join the main thread because they finished, right? So it, it again, it, it is kind of like a hierarchy, right? So if if you imagine this is the main thread, and then at some point the main thread continues, but at some point then you have a kind of a fork. And then from that fork, you have a child thread. Uh, and then the child thread finishes. Then what will happen is you will have this kind of uh, join back to the main thread because the child finished, right? So then at this point, we, we call it a join because it kind of looks like the child lifetime joined back the, the main thread, right? Okay, so uh, we have this. Um, so we have a term, so going back to our discussion, we have um, uh, parallel and concurrent. We have introduced a kind of a new term called join. Uh, I also introduced a new term called go routines. And go routines are basically those, um, those light threads which are created by the go keyword, right? Um, we will go back to that in a moment. Uh, first, let's talk about channels. Uh, did you use channels in Golang? You didn't. <laughs> yeah. So we did introduce channels in, in Golang. And in Rust, you also have channels. Um, so in Rust, there is, um... oh, come on. So spawn is for spawning threads. Um, so to start new thread, you do this. And then for channels, uh, there is um, a channel. 
And this function creates a channel for you. So let me just use um, uh, so I will not make a mistake. Uh, spelling mistake because we're not using the we're not using the um, MP that's correct spelling and the channel uh, provides us with the sender and the receiver and it's exactly the same as in Golang um, that they have a certain type uh, which is inferred so if I if I call this like this uh, I'm creating a um, unidirectional channel from the sender to the receiver over a certain um, data type. And the data type will be clear once I actually send something to the um, to the sender, right? So if I um, if I say sender send number twenty one, then we know that we are talking about in thirty two, right? Uh, so that's the type which is being sent over a channel. Uh, and this call is non-blocking. And then somewhere else in the in the kind of a threads uh, or inside this closure, for example, you can receive um, you can receive it. So let's let's do that. So let's okay. So I will say um, I will say uh, thread spawn, and then we're gonna pass we're gonna pass a closure, and then we will say okay um, receiver receive, um, and then we're gonna say let value equals this, right? Uh, receive returns a result, so we have to unwrap it. To get the uint32, we have to unwrap um, the result. And then this runs in a separate thread, and then in the main thread, we sending the value, right? So what will happen with this child thread at this line when the sender hasn't sent uh, the value yet. What will happen? Well, two things might happen. One thing is the value is already ready, so we're going to get it. The second thing is the value has not been sent yet, so the value is not ready. And then this will block and wait for the value, right? Um, Usually you have two options. You have either blocking API or non-blocking API. The blocking API will wait and uh, wait in this line for the result and it will block the thread. Non-blocking one will return that the value is not ready yet, right? Um, so here we have kind of a, a pseudo-ish code example of channels, um, but the concept is a little bit bigger. So the concept is about future, future and promise. So what is a future and promise? Future promise is kind of a metaphor which we do exactly for this type of synchronizations. A future is a future value of something that has been promised by the sender to be delivered, right? So usually that part, the, the sending part is called a promise and the receiving part is called the future. So it's like a future value, which has not been calculated yet. And then it's gonna be delivered because the sender is promising to calculate it. And those, usually they live in two different threads, right? So in one thread, you are kind of waiting for the value for the future. And then in one thread, you have got the promise and then you can kind of do this, right? So in, in Rust, they are called channels, 
And in Golang, they are called channels and you can use channels to simulate future and promises. And the sender would be a promise and the receiver is the future, right? Uh, usually you have two APIs, one which allows you to deliver the value and one allows you to read the value. So um, many programming languages have that and they kind of uh, call them future promises or just futures or channels. A channel can simulate um, the, the uh, promises and, um, and uh, futures. So then uh, we have one more concept. So again, it's a little bit of hand wavy. I'm kind of just giving you kind of a concept when you really need to do multi-threaded programming and to do kind of a synchronization, you will look up for a join API or for this uh, uh, future and promise API, right? Uh, or for channels in case of Golang and Rust, you, you have a very easy mechanism for doing um, uh, this type of uh, programming with just channels. There is one catch, this code will not compile uh, for the reason of memory management and it will complain that you sort of um, cannot safely access receiver if receiver is owned by the um, by the main thread, right? So this code is correct logically, but Rust will not compile it. It will say, "Wait a minute! Like you accessing receiver here, but receiver is owned by the main thread, so you know it's unsafe." Like we kind of cannot do this. So then you basically, what you have to do is you have to move, you have to move um, the receiver to the closure. So when you say, okay, I'm moving um, the receiver to the closure, then it will compile and it will work. But now the receiver is owned by the closure, not by the main thread anymore. So if main thread tries to do something with receiver here, the compiler will complain again. But that, that's not our intention. Our intention is, for the receiver to be handled in the closure and the sender to be handled here. You can switch the roles around, right? We can basically uh, switch switch that around and say, okay, um, if we are waiting here for the receiver, I should have choose a shorter name, receiver receive. If we're waiting here and we sending you know, we're doing some calculations here and we're sending value here. Send 21. Then, of course, the receiver is not moved. It's the sender which is moved. So the compiler can work out what in the closure is accessed from the environment and it's going to move that, right? So, you you know, you can kind of uh, either move the sender or move the receiver and use the other, while, other one somewhere else. Um, if I had another thread, I can spawn another thread and use and wait in the other thread for the receiver. Uh, that is also possible, but I would also need to move that receiver out of the main thread to the new thread, right? Okay, so that, that's the, the uh, channels, futures, and promises. So the final thing uh, is uh, async, um, async and await. Uh, and that's kind of the mechanism in... Um, in Rust, which allows you to do things even easier. Uh, so here, if for example, um, we uh, we have a function, if, if it's a main function, you have to do it like this, but if it's another function, so we have some process function, and then we are having some function which generates a value, uh, what we can do is we can say, I have an asynchronous function, which uh, generates me a value and it returns in 32. And then, you know, uh, some work here and then we return 21, right? So then in our process, we can say it's an async process function, which doesn't open channels, which doesn't spawn the new thread. It basically says, let uh, A equals gen value. And then I need to do something with, with A. 
so the rest of Uh, the rest of function here, we need to use A. So if we need to use A, because we need to return, let's say we need to return also wind 32, and we say we want to say plus 10, then what we do here is we say await. And a wait will wait for the value to be ready. It will synchronize for us. And it, this call will not return immediately, but it will wait for the value to be ready. If I call this without this, this, this will return immediately, but it will return either uh, that the value is pending or it will say the value is ready and the value is dropped. So it, it returns an enum either with the value missing with the uh, item saying pending. Uh, so it's um, either pending or uh, ready, and then the ready has the value, right? Uh, if I say await, then I am choosing the blocking call. So here you see the difference between blocking and non-blocking API. You either are non-blocking, but you are risking getting no value because it's not ready yet, or you're saying I want the blocking one, and then you say await, and then it's a blocking one, and it will wait until the value is ready, right? And then it will return. So those keywords, async and await, are kind of a metaphor for synchronizing kind of a value passing and returning of the functions such that you can organize your code yeah, accordingly. The, there is a little bit more to it, but the concepts are kind of simple as that, right? And then you don't need channels because you can wait for the function to return the actual value, right? Instead of passing the value through the uh, through the channel. All right, so that's that's a little bit dive into future promises, async and await channels and parallel parallel and concurrent programming. Um, I cannot cover the whole thing, as I told you, like we used to have a course, a full semester course on this. <laughs> so obviously in a half a lecture, I cannot tell you everything, but that, that gives you a direction which you can look up further. So if you have a task which requires kind of a parallel uh, concurrent processing, then you can kind of uh, dig in and uh, try to do it in Golang or in Rust um, using the con constructs which are there. Okay, so any questions? Yep. What are we doing on uh, Thursday? So on Thursday, I have to go to Trondheim because we have, um, yeah, so I will stop the recording.